machines without human beings. Machines without human beings, that uncanny spectacle is automation. A foreboding, frightening word. A word to send a shudder through a man or a woman or a child, even in periods of full employment when wages are decent, jobs are plentiful, and times are good. But during a depression or a recession when men and women and children seem to be in overproduction, then automation is a word to strike terror in any human heart, especially if that human heart beats in a wage earner's breast. Now people know in a general way what automation means. 150 years ago, the world went through something called the Industrial Revolution. We found out how to build machines that could perform much of the mechanical work men and women used to do. Machines replaced the muscles in our backs and arms and legs, but you still needed human beings to direct the machines, to do the thinking, to do the brain work. But now automation provides machines that do the brain work, that make the decisions men and women used to make in the factories. Electric eyes, limit switches, tapes, punch cards, servo mechanisms. Everybody knows that, but what does this mechanical brain plus a mechanical muscle do to people, to jobs, to the way we live? Will whatever happens happen automatically? Can we do anything? Well, not long ago, UAW President Walter Ruther was in Washington, D.C. There, the members of a senatorial committee ask him these very questions. So now let's go to Washington and Walter Ruther. Here is Mr. Ruther. And here is the senatorial committee. How does automation look when you see it in the plant? What happens when automation comes to a plant? Let's let Senator Langer of North Dakota ask the question. Senator Langer? Mr. Ruther, you say that these uh, three big uh, corporations put seven billion two hundred million dollars into automotive, automotive uh, uh, machinery, whatever it may be. How many men does that put out of work? Well, it's hard to give you an exact figure. These are some of the things we'd like to know more about. We do know, we do know that we have felt the impact of automation. I worked first time I went to work in the automotive industry was back in 1927, in February. They were making the last Model T Ford, Senator Langer. And you know all about a Model T because up in your country they were very handy back in the days when the roads weren't very good. Very handy in politics, too, driving around. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were. I think, uh, I think Senator Langer still uh, campaigns in the Model T, I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, when I went to work at Ford's in 1927, this was before we had automation, took thousands and thousands of workers on individual machines to make a Model T engine, which is a relatively simple piece of mechanism. I mean, they bored each cylinder separately, and they did all the other things on separate operations. 1951, the Ford Motor Company opened up a new engine plant in Cleveland, Ohio, adjacent to this, the municipal airport. It was the first fully automated engine plant. They take a rough casting of a V8 engine, which is a very complex piece of mechanism compared to a Model T engine block. They bring it from the foundry and feed it into this automated machining line, completely automatic, and without a worker's hand touching that engine block, 14 and 6 tenths minutes later, it's fully machined. I went through that plant many years back, and the people who were showing me around said to me, I couldn't hardly see the workers because there were just a few here and a few there watching electric panels, red and green lights going on that showed whether the machine was operating to standard. When all the green lights were on, it meant that every tool in a battery of machines was operating to performance, meeting the, the, the precise tolerances of the machining operation. When an amber light came on, the machine was still operating, but this was a signal that the tool in station number 82 was becoming fatigued. The worker got a replacement tool, walked over in front of 82. When the red light went on, the machine stopped. He put the new tool in, the green light came on, she went on. Without a worker's hand touching that, 14 and 6 tenths minutes later, it was fully machined. And so they said to me, aren't you worried about how you're going to collect union dues from all these machines? I said, you know, the thought never occurred to me. What I'm worried about is how you're going to sell Ford cars to all these machines. 
You know, you can automate the production of automobiles, but consumers are still made, thank God, in the old-fashioned way. This is our trouble. <laughs> this is our trouble. This is our trouble. Model T to experimental model electronic flash. From muscle and blood to the automated engine line. Mr. Ruther, tell us, what has this meant economically to the automobile industry? But if you take some overall figures, which I think indicates what's happening in terms of productivity. In 1947, the industry made 4,798,000 cars and trucks. And we had a workforce in 1947 of 648,800 workers. In 1957, 10 years later, we made 7,220,000 cars and trucks with a workforce of 652,000 workers. In other words, in those 10 years, we had an increase in the total production of cars of 50.5%, with only an increase of one half of 1% in the labor force. So that if you take the level of production in 47, and the level of production in 57, and the level of employment in 47, and the level of employment in 57, you find that production went up 50.5%, and employment went up only one half of 1%. What Walter Ruther is saying is that American companies in the last 11 years have bought and built $385 billion worth of new factories and new equipment, much of it automated equipment. In the auto industry alone, the big three have invested $7,200,000,000 in modern automated facilities. And the result has been unemployment, like this unemployment like these unemployed General Motors workers. There they are, here we are. People wanting jobs, needing jobs. And there are the new factories, modern as all get out, but closed down tight. Since this is the way things have worked out, Mr. Ruther, do you oppose all this expansion? We don't object to that expansion in our productive capacity because we know the workers that I represent, they're grown people. They know that there are no economic Santa Clauses, that you can't get something for nothing, that you can only have higher living standards and more of the good things of life only as you create the economic wealth by the application of human labor and human intelligence to the tools of economic abundance and the economic resources that we have access to. So they say, fine, we've got a bigger plant capacity, we've got more modern and more productive tools, but they say, if we aren't using these tools and we've got idle capacity and unemployment, then why? And the answer is, we aren't using our co productive capacity because we haven't got the purchasing power in the hands of millions <coughs> of families necessary to translate human needs into demand on the store counters of America. And that's why we're in trouble. We're in trouble, Walter Ruther says. In a sense, these machines can only do almost everything a human being can do. But not everything. Machines don't buy automobiles, for example, and that means unemployment. All right, since this is the situation, is the UAW opposed to automation? Many people, at least, have been told that unions oppose technological advances. Mr. Ruther, what about that? I have, I have been very sad when I hear a labor spokesman fight against improved technology. You know, King Canute couldn't stop the flow of the tide, and labor can't stop the flow of technology. Labor ought to welcome technology. You haven't gotten our pamphlets on automation. I shall see that you get them, because we have we have been standing on the housetops saying, give us the best automation you can bring in. Give us the most productive tools, because we know that the only way we can have more is to make more, and the only way you can make more is to have more productive tools. We have been leading the parade for automation. We want automation, we want the peaceful use of the atom, because only as we apply human labor, whether it be with hand or with brain, to the tools of production, can we create the economic wealth that we want to share? This is a General Motors contract that we signed in 1955. On page 66, section 100 reads as follows. 
This is out of our agreement. My signature is at the end of this agreement. It reads as follows, and I quote, the annual improvement factor provided herein recognizes that a continuing improvement in the standards of living of employees depends upon technological progress, better tools, methods, processes, and equipment, and cooperative attitude on the part of all parties in such progress. It further, recogni it further recognizes the principle that to produce more with the same amount of human effort is a sound economic and social objective. We want the best tools that General Motors can buy. We want the most productive automation machinery that the General Motors and Ford and Chrysler can create in cooperation with the machine tool industry. On this, there is no argument. We know we can have more only if the tools of production create more, and we want the most productive tools available. Let us suppose that we had no autom automation no multiple drills, no huge presses to press out frames. What, in your judgment, would be the cost of an ordinary automobile today compared with the price that it actually obtains in the market? If we did not have the tools of mass production That's and right. economic abundance, That's right. there would be no automobile industry. Yes. There'd still be a few built around by hand and only a few fellows who were millionaire sport car owners would have them. They'd just be a handful, and the roads would still be muddy and so forth. We all know that. But why do we make progress? We make progress because management wants to drive ahead. They want to make more money. They want to get more of the things that they want. But workers, when they drive for higher wages, why is it in a country where, there, where you have coolie wages, why is it that their rate of technology is always slower? Because when manpower is cheaper than machines, nobody gets a machine. But when you raise wages and it costs more to have manpower than machines, you invest in technology. And the drive for higher wages is perhaps the most powerful motivation that accelerates technological progress. On one thing, Walter Ruther and President Eisenhower are agreed. Automation by itself is not good or bad. It is like a knife or high explosive. It can be used to advance the well-being of people. Then it is good. Or it can be used to produce dark, hopeless tragedy, and then it is evil. But the question is, how do you tame automation? How do you make it serve people? The UAW says when men or women are laid off because of automation, when the plant moves, people should be given new jobs. If there are not new jobs, they should be given moving allowances to places where there are jobs. If they need training, they should get training. If they have to be re-educated for new jobs, then they should get the education and allowances to live on in the in-between times. But says Senator Dirksen, who is sensitive to the interest of the big companies, doesn't this cost money? Now, among other things, you include, of course, uh, severance pay and also removal pay, where a facility is removed to another town and the employees have an opportunity to go so that uh, they would be paid for moving to another site. I think that's in your bargaining demand. That's right, but that's, that's not a cost factor. Because when the company moves the factory, now let me give you a good example. You know, there's been a lot of uh, political propaganda circulating in Michigan about how the climate in Michigan, because of the Democratic administration in the, in the governor's office, is creating an unfavorable political climate, and the automobile industry are all running away, and other companies are running out of Michigan. But that isn't true. They're moving for reasons quite unrelated to politics. And the best example is that the last decision made by the Chrysler Corporation, and the Chrysler Corporation is the last of the big three who have decentralized their operations. Uh, General Motors started out on a more decentralized basis. Ford was pretty compact in Detroit. They have decentralized since the war, and Chrysler now is getting around to that sort of thing. Chrysler Corporation recently announced that they were moving a plant from Evansville, Indiana, two plants there to St. Louis, Missouri. Now, in Indiana, they consider that they got the most favorable political climate. They got a Republican administration, they got a right to work law, they got everything that, that the people who represent that point of view thinks 
constitutes a completely favorable climate from industry's point of view. And yet they're moving out of Indiana into a democratic city in a democratic state. Why? Because these moves have nothing to do with politics. They are moving there because the Evansville plant is antiquated. It's an old plant. It's inefficient. It's a high cost unit plant in terms of its physical layout and its equipment. And they're going to build a brand new plant in St. Louis. But the reason they aren't building a new plant in Evansville is St. Louis is closer to the market that that plant will service. And that's why they're moving. Now, when the Chrysler Corporation moves, they will have to pay for the cost of moving their machinery and all the other things that go into the physical plant. And we think that moving the worker's family or providing the worker with some cushion until he can make a readjustment and get relocated himself is a part of the cost of doing business, just like moving the machinery. Now, the Chrysler Corporation will have a more modern, more efficient plant, and they will pay for the cost of moving the machinery out of the greater efficiency, out of the greater profitability of the new plant, and we think they ought to pay for the cost of moving the workers out of the same greater pro profitability and greater efficiency. So this isn't new money. This isn't going to cost the consumer anything. And I just think that, that if moving machinery is absorbed as a normal cost of doing business, that moving people also should be. That's all this is. But it won't cost the consumer a penny. Unions tell us that it is possible to plan automation so that it is introduced into the economy in such a way that the nation moves forward and no wage earner is hurt in the process at relatively no additional cost to the company. But this is hard to believe. Mr. Ruther, could you explain exactly how this would work out financially, specifically in this Evansville case, for example? How can you pay severance pay without adding to a company's cost? Well, I would like to say this about the severance pay. The Chrysler, the two plants of the Chrysler Motor Car Company that are now operating, they're still operating, uh, not very fully, but they're operating, in Evansville, Indiana, they had, when they were operating, 5,300 employees, the two plants together. They will turn out more production in the new and more efficient plant in St. Louis when it's completed two years from now, but they tell us that they will only employ 3,500 workers, so that there's a tremendous economy. And that economy that will result from the new and more efficient plants that reduces the number of workers from 5,300 to 3,500 with greater productivity will more than cover all the cost of moving the plant and the severance pay and the transfer allowance that we're asking for. And therefore, this is not a cost factor because the company will make the move and make a profit out of moving. Well, here we are back again with our original word, automation. Machines that do things and make choices without human beings. You and I and a Senate committee and Walter Ruther have had a discussion. Why? Because it's our common problem. If we can solve it and make automation our servant, then we will cross the bridge to prosperity and peace and democracy. But if we fail, and automation produces the bleak terror of unemployment, there will be no prosperity, no peace, no freedom. The question is, what shall we do to succeed, to tame automation? We, you, Walter Ruther, the companies, the United States Senate.